I'm a sleep researcher, and a sleep researcher start to walk when others go to sleep. I joined the Technion in 1975, and I opened the sleep research laboratory. And during the first years, most of the research focused on uh, cycles of alertness during the day, when to schedule pilots, how to schedule shift work. And we coined two terms that are used in the um, sleep world. One is uh, the sleep gate, the other one is the forbidden zone for sleep. Uh, the sleep gate means that each one of us has an optimal time of going to sleep, a time during which the brain is ready to make the wakefulness to sleep transition. It's a very narrow window during which we should go to sleep. Most of us, by the way, do not obey this law of sleep gate. And on the other hand, there is the forbidden zone for sleep, which surprisingly, uh, during the two hours before the opening of the sleep gate, there is a period of maximum alertness. When we describe it for the first time in the literature, nobody believed us because why on God earth you have the best two hours of the day just before the sleep gate? Now it was uh, uh, found by many, many researchers all over the world, and there is even a theory that there is a, a, a specific function uh, for this forbidden zone for sleep that serves the brain in order to synchronize the sleep-wake cycle to the light-dark cycle in the environment. During the early days, I also became interested in the effect of trauma on sleep. Some of our studies dealt with post-traumatic stress disorder patients, many of them soldiers from the Yom Kippur War and even from the Six Day War. And one of our most important studies at that time was dreams of Holocaust survivors. We investigated in the laboratory two groups of survivors, some that uh, adjusted to the post-war life without any scars, and some that didn't adjust so well. And again, surprising findings. We uh, reported that survivors who adjusted to the Holocaust, post-Holocaust life, without any noticeable scars, suppressed their dreams. They simply didn't dream. When we woke, up, woke them up from uh, REM sleep, which is dreaming sleep, they say simply, I didn't dream. And even the, the few dreams that they remembered were devoid of any emotions and they were almost like telegraphic dreams. And we hypothesized, again, ahead of our time, that uh, uh, one of the most important ways to cope with a massive trauma is suppression of uh, traumatic memories, even during sleep. Here we had a discovery or a finding that uh, shaked the psychiatric world. This wasn't very well received by the psychiatric uh, uh, profession. And uh, for many years, they blamed us for uh, uh, making the wrong interpretation and uh, uh, not understanding the function of dreams. I should say with great satisf satisfaction now that there are more supportive evidence that we were right in recent uh, research on traumatized patients, including the trauma of the twin buildings in New York. We found the link between sleep apnea, or breathing disorders and sleep in one side, and cardiovascular diseases on the other side. We showed that sleep apnea is a risk factor for hypertension. And again, this uh, uh, steer a lot of excitement and a lot of uh, uh, interest in our work, because uh, um, if indeed sleep apnea is a risk factor for cardiovascular diseases, if you treat sleep apnea, you can reduce the uh, um, risk of uh, having cardiovascular disease. And in the last 10 years or so, we focus on uh, the mechanism that underlie the link between the fact that you stop breathing during sleep and cardiovascular disease. And I was lucky enough to be married to a biochemist, uh, my colleague for uh, so many years and now my partner in research. And what we showed in the last 10 years is that sleep apnea is one of the major causes 
of inflammation within the arteries, within the blood vessels. We are now working on the cells themselves. So what we do, the patient is sleeping in the laboratory. In the morning, we take a blood sample. We isolate the blood cells and we investigate what happened to the blood cells that are exposed to the apneas in the patient's blood vessels during the night. And uh, uh, just imagine a patient that stopped breathing 300, 400 times, his oxygen level in the blood is going up and down 400 times every night. So what we found out, that there is a change in the function and the morphology of the blood cells during the night. So they become more attached to each other, more attached to the walls of the vessels. And this is a process that uh, uh, the medical uh, uh, community called atherosclerosis, blocking of the art of the uh, uh, blood vessels. And uh, if this goes on a night after night, for hundreds of nights, it can cause heart attack, stroke, uh, 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 peripheral uh, blocking of the arteries, etc., etc. So this is our focus in the last uh, several years. We, un we revealed several mechanisms that explain why this process take place, what are the different actors in this uh, nightly drama, if you wish, and how treatment can reverse this process. We discovered, again, surprisingly, that elderly patients who survive the age of 65 or 70 with very severe sleep apnea uh, do not die because of the disease. In fact, they live longer than the general population. And this led us to hypothesize that this intermittent decrease in oxygen level can serve a long-term adaptation in certain individuals. It prepares the heart for a heart attack and decrease the damage because of heart attacks. The question is, who are the individuals that develop this mechanism? What is the underlying biochemical process that subserves this function? And how we can use it for the benefit of the patient? Being a researcher in an institute like the Technion, which is probably uh, among the top uh, technological institutes in the world, it will be only natural that someone will try to marry technology with uh, scientific research. And uh, we develop several technologies that uh, uh, change the way uh, sleep medicine is practiced. Uh, one of our developments was uh, electronic mustache that allow someone to test himself whether he has a sleep apnea or not. Uh, this moustache is taped be, uh, below the nose. With the electronic moustache, we have sensors that sense the airflow. And once they detect that there is a cessation of airflow, they make a count. So if you put it throughout the night, it counts each time you stop breathing and accumulate the number of events. And if it passes a threshold, then it raises a flag or a blinking light saying, go and see your doctor. Other technologies were developed to do measurements outside the sleep clinic. One is to take a device the size of a wristwatch, we call it a watch pad, and the patient take it home, put it on his finger. We use blood flow in the finger the pattern of blood flow, the speed of blood flow, the volume of blood flow, in order to tell us everything we wanted to know about sleep. I can pick from the finger the moment someone is falling asleep, someone is in a dreaming sleep, in a deep sleep, light sleep, when he wake up and when he stop breathing. And if indeed he has breathing disorders in sleep, we can do the cardiac test with the endopath in order to see how severe it is. And these two devices are now commercially available all over the world and were developed in the sleep laboratory. The zero hour is a phenomenon in which school children start their studies an hour earlier than regular time, instead of eight o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning. And uh, for many years, I was uh, very critical of the zero hour because sleep has a major, major function in memory, in learning, in maturation, 
particularly the young ages. Now, a kid who has to be at school at 7, wake up at 5.30. And this, I considered, a major, major uh, uh, problem, at, uh, particularly at the elementary school age. And we showed in several studies that there is a link between the hours of sleep and achievements in school in children. And we started a public campaign, and we were successful. The Ministry of Education decided to abolish zero hour at the elementary school and even at mid-school level. Interestingly, many states in the U.S. asked for my studies, particularly in the Minneapolis area and uh, uh, Rhode Island area, and this was very gratifying to see that they copied what we did in Israel. So uh, I did something for the sleep of Americans, not only for the sleep of Israelis. I think that many people who suffer from sleep disorders take sleep for granted. And sleep is a behavior that has to be respected. For instance, uh, don't smoke uh, before sleep. Don't eat heavily before sleep. Don't exercise before sleep. Keep as much as possible wake and sleep time constant. Uh, make sure that your bedroom is comfortable. Many, many people don't realize that if you sleep with your uh, uh, shades open, the light will wake you up early in the morning. Uh, some people are very sensitive to the clock in their bedroom. So the issue of sleep hygiene is more important than we can imagine. So in order to uh, allow a good night's sleep, you have to respect sleep and keep some rules, simple rules, uh, uh, daily in order to ensure that your sleep is sound and uh, restorative.